Hi everyone, I'm Larry Huppen. I am a medical consultant at ProLab Orthotics and today we're going to talk about evidence-based treatment of pediatric flat foot, particularly as it uh, pertains to foot orthoses. Uh, so here's what we're going to look at. First, we're going to look at when you should treat and when you should just monitor uh, patients with uh, pediatric flat foot. A second thing we'll look at is if you're going to treat with an orthotic device uh, is trying to decide whether or not you're going to use a prefabricated or a custom device, uh, particularly looking at what the evidence currently recommends. And then finally, we're going to look at what type of orthotic recommendations you're, you are going to want to use in order to get the best potential clinical outcome and this this these uh, modifications are going to apply whether or not you're using a custom device or a prefabricated orthosis so your first question is when to treat and we're going to look at what the literature tells us about uh, kids with flat feet and when they should be treated so the, the first study we're going to look at was by Evans. Uh, this was in Japman 2008. And she did a meta-analysis of a number of different studies, and particularly looking at uh, three that, that had uh, uh, some good information. Uh, Wenger in 89 actually noted that orthoses did not seem to influence the course of a flexible flat foot. Uh, Powell in 2005 showed that uh, patients with uh, juvenile rheumatoid arthritis using a custom semi-rigid foot orthosis uh, had significant improvement in pain levels. Uh, they had improvement in speed of ambulation and overall their activity levels increased with the use of, of, uh, of uh, custom orthoses compared with prefabricated devices. And then Whitford in, 20, in uh, 2007 showed some mixed results. But based on these and the other studies she looked at, uh, Evans came up with a clinical care pathway that she called a traffic light system where she had a red light or a symptomatic group, a yellow light which were asymptomatic but poor structure and then the green light which are uh, patients with transient flat foot. So let's look at each of these. So the first group we have are those in that green light group. These are normal flat foot patients. Or, uh, so these are kids and as we all know uh, it's normal for children to be flat-footed uh, uh, up to about the age of six. In fact, uh, it, in a study by, by Val Massey, it was shown that uh, kids start with a heel everted, an average of about six degrees, and that decreases about one degree per year up to about age six. So it's certainly not unusual, say, for a three-year-old to have a Pez planus foot type, and, and there's no reason that that needs to be treated. I think that's uh, fairly non-contentious. The second group are those who have a flatter than average foot for their age and are having symptoms. So these are kids that have pain. They may have early bunion formation. Maybe they're developing some uh, midfoot osteoarthritis in the form of, say, a metatarsal cuneiform exostosis at a very young age. Um, uh, these patients should be treated. It, it makes sense to support these kids. Uh, and, and again, I think that's uh, fairly non-contentious. And then finally, we have this group, uh, the yellow group, which is the, uh, uh, the, the, these are kids who do have a pes planus foot, and we can say that, let's just say it's a pes planus foot greater than average for their age, and, but they're asymptomatic. And so this becomes more controversial. Do you treat these children who have a greater than average amount of pes planus for their age, but really aren't complaining of any sort of pain? So the question gets to be, should it be treated just in case in, in order to prevent problems later on? Well, first, we don't really have evidence one way or another whether prophylactic use of either prefabricated or custom orthoses will prevent these problems. So I think there's some uh, items you can look at when you're making the decision. Certainly age, their, their weight, family history can be considered. Um, so let's, um, let's go into this a little bit more detail. This is what we are recommending that in the, for this this group of the asymptomatic but greater than average pes planus uh, foot in children, certainly if they have juvenile, juvenile rheumatoid arthritis, there's good evidence that the use of orthoses is beneficial. If the child is overweight, there's more and more evidence that there's benefit to that, and we'll look at that in a minute here. And I think one of the more important ones is whether or not there is a family history of pathology 
associated with pes planus. So if they if the if the child has a pes planus foot type, but there's a family history of pes planus with absolutely no foot problems whatsoever, I think it's less important to try and treat these patients than it might be if the family has a history of pes planus but has associated problems, for example, bunion formation, midfoot osteoarthritis, pain, anything that you might associate with a pes planus foot type. I think it makes more sense to treat those patients. So probably the most important aspect of this is just simply being able to educate the parent about the advantages and disadvantages and then let them make the final decision on whether or not they wish to treat their child. Certainly, however, I don't feel there is any real long-term disadvantage to treating these kids. It just may not be necessary. I think it's important to spend a moment at least on obesity and flat foot. There is more and more evidence that there's a strong relationship between the obesity epidemic that we are seeing in children and increased rates of flat foot and the pathologies that might be associated with that. Uh, just for example, I won't go over each of these, but Chen did a large study in 2009, over a thousand kids, uh, showing that children who normal had normal weight, 27% of them had, had a pes planus foot type overweight 31% and obese kids 56% had a pes planus foot type. Um, Pfeiffer in 2006 had, near, had just over 800 patients showed that pediatric flat foot is influenced by age, gender and most particularly by weight and then Mosh in 2008 did a very large study nearly 3,000 kids in the study and found that flat feet uh, was twice as likely in overweight children than those kids who ha were of normal weight. So the next question is, if you are going to treat these children, are you going to use a custom device or are you going to use a prefabricated device? Evans and Rome in 2011 looked at this. They did a study titled, titled A Review of the Evidence for Non-Surgical Interventions for Flexible Pediatric Flat Feet. They took an algorithmic approach based on pain, age, flexibility, gender, weight, and the degree of hypermobility. They found that when foot orthoses were indicated, prefab would usually work a majority of the time and that they reserved custom devices for kids who had arthritic changes or had um, symptomatic or uh, systemic arthritis such as JRA who had unusual morphology so they just would not fit into well into a prefab or were unresponsive to a prefabricated device. And they also noted that surgery is almost never necessary for pediatric flat foot unless it is a, a rigid, uh, for example, a plantar flex talus um, and only at the failure of thorough conservative treatment. All right, so now we're going to look at orthotic intervention in more detail. Specifically, what modifications might you want to include in an orthotic device? And again, I want to emphasize that these same modifications are going to be true whether you're doing a prefabricated device or a custom orthosis. So just very briefly, briefly we'll look at the mechanics of pediatric flat foot. Uh, first of all, obviously, there's a lower than average longitudinal arch on the medial aspect. Usually the calcaneus is in an everted position. There's often an equinus component to this and often the forefoot and midfoot are abducted on the rear foot. So we really have three goals for orthotic therapy for these kids. Number one is that we want to re increase the ground reactive forces medial to the subtalar joint axis. This represents the subtalar joint axis on a normal arch foot and this represents the subtalar joint axis on a pes planus foot. That axis moves medially as the talus internally rotates on that pes planus foot. And so we have a much smaller area medial to that axis in order to put force in order to increase supinatory torque around that axis. We'll look at that in more detail in a second. Second, we want to improve calcaneal position on the ground. If the heel's everted, we're going to try and decrease the everted position. And finally, we want to support the medial longitudinal arch and prevent it from collapsing. So let's first look at this goal one, which is increased ground reactive forces medial to the subtalar joint axis. Several modifications uh, can play a role in this. First, we're going to look at the medial heel skive, and we're looking here at two orthoses. Here's the medial aspect and here's the medial aspect. You'll notice on this one here, 
it is flattened relative to the lateral portion. That flattened portion is a varus wedge within the heel cup, also known as a medial scythe. What that simply does is shift the point of maximum force that that foot, that orthosis is applying to the heel farther medial. It increases the lever arm medial to the subtalar joint axis and increases the supinatory torque around that axis in order to help reduce excessive pronation. We're also going to recommend a deep heel cup. Here's a fairly standard heel cup here and here is a deeper heel cup. Now particularly when we're using that medial scythe, you'll note that unless we have a fairly deep heel cup, we're not going to have enough orthotic next to the heel that scythe to be effective. So a deeper heel cup will help limit heel eversion, particularly when you are using a medial heel scythe. We're going to use a wide orthosis, so it's at least the full width of the foot, and probably incorporate a medial flange uh, that will also increase surface area medial to the subtalar joint axis. Let me go back to that previous slide. And we see that on that more pronated foot, there's a small area here available to put force medial to the subtalar joint axis in order to increase the supination moment around that axis. So by making the device wider and incorporating the medial flange, we in increase the surface area medial to that axis. And then finally, we want to have a rigid or semi-rigid orthotic plate. If the device is too flexible, it will collapse underneath the foot and will not be as effective at supporting that foot. Orthotic goal number two is improve calcaneal position on the ground. And again, some of these same uh, uh, modifications will help us with that. A deep heel cup certainly will improve ground reactive forces in the frontal plane to help limit heel eversion, as will a rear foot post. You can see that's the purple portion right here. That takes the round surface of the orthosis and makes it flat, so it is much less likely to rock in the frontal plane. Um, the larger that post is, in fact, usually the more stable the orthosis is. And then once again, the medial heel scythe by applying force medial to the subtalar joint axis will help limit heel eversion. And then goal number three is to support the medial longitudinal arch of the orthosis. If you're making a custom orthotic, you would be prescribing a minimum cast fill. That is one where very little extra expansion is added into the medial arch. These are on old plaster casts, but you would do the same thing with a custom device if you were designing a, um, if you were, have, if it was being made using uh, CAD CAM correction. And again, looking at a prefab device, you still want the same corrections. So basically what that means is your orthosis is going to conform closer to the arch of the foot. The tighter it conforms to the arch of the foot, the less collapse there is going to be of the medial longitudinal arch. And then once again, we look for a wider width device. It doesn't have to be wider than the foot, but it should be at least as wide as the foot in order to give maximum support and also incorporate, as we see here, a medial flange to wrap up around the medial arch and provide additional support and additional force medial to the subtalar joint axis. So here's our orthotic recommendations. Number one, it should be a, a rigid or semi-rigid device, the, the plastic itself. It should be wide and probably incorporate a medial, um, medial flange for maximum support. A deep heel cup, a minimum cast fill so it conforms close to the arch of the foot. A medial heel scythe, uh, usually four to six millimeters is appropriate for a pes planus foot type and a rear foot post to help prevent that orthosis from rocking in the frontal plane. So now let's look at what our initial treatment should be. And here we're going to look at prefabricated orthoses. Um, it, I think there's a lot of advantages to using prefabs as an initial treatment for these patients. Uh, number one, there are some prefabs on the market now that incorporate all of these corrections that previously were only available on a functional custom orthosis. So there are some really quite amazing prefabs now that incorporate all of those, including medial scythes, deep heel cups, medial flanges, and the rear foot post. It allows for immediate treatment. This, it, this improves follow through, uh, makes it more likely they actually will be, get into the orthotic device, and it certainly is, improves convenience for both the uh, 
patient and their parent and that the parent doesn't have to take any extra time off of work to come back in either for casting for custom orthoses or to pick up the orthoses. Uh, obviously it's cost effective uh, it, that's appreciated by both parents and refers but we also have to keep in mind that this is the trend in healthcare. we are looking for optimum clinical outcome at the least expensive cost and and the, in this situation the t the correct type of prefabricated device can certainly do that for us and finally this is supported by the literature as the first line treatment so again, I do want to say, I want to give a disclosure. This is a ProLab webinar and I, I'm an employee of ProLab, but um, with that, we have designed a children's orthotic for the flat-footed child. And this is based on what is currently in the literature. It's the most effective type of orthosis for this foot type. Uh, again, it's a rigid polypropylene. We have a deep heel cup, that wide width with a medial flange has a higher than average arch, so it conforms closer to the arch of the foot to help stop collapse of the medial arch, incorporates a medial heel skive, uh, and it has a large rear foot post. And it then also comes in a number of different sizes so you can get close sizing, anywhere from a beginner walker up to about age seven, even up to about age eight. So summary here, the evidence does support treating symptomatic and in some cases asymptomatic flat feet with orthotic devices. Uh, the evidence also supports treating with prefabricated devices prior to custom, uh, although certainly some of these patients will not be, will not get maximum outcome with the prefabricated devices and, and that is the time you'll want to move on to a custom orthosis. And regardless of whether it's prefab or custom, there are some specific orthotic criteria that provide optimum support for, for pediatric flat foot. Just a couple resources I would, uh, you should take a look at. Um, Recent Advances in Orthotic Therapy is an excellent book on looking at the literature and specific recommendations on orthotics for specific uh, pathologies by Dr. Paul Shear, and also the series of books by uh, Kevin Kirby on foot and lower extremity biomechanics. Both are very practical uh, guides to orthotic therapy. Uh, the ProLab website at prolaborthotics.com has a tremendous amount of information, including additional uh, webinars like this one on specific pathologies. There's articles, there's reviews of journal articles, and a number of other videos. And also, if you are a ProLab client, uh, there are medical consultants available pretty much every workday uh, to discuss specific patients. So I hope that's been uh, helpful for you. For you, if you have any questions, please contact us and uh, take a look at the website to see what other webinars might be available that you will find interesting.